diferente. Amazing Grace. It's interesting that Brother Turner singing that song, and I'm going to be singing a song about grace. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you guys here this evening, cold evening. Glad you came out. Uh, we're going to have a, a great service tonight. Already had started off good with that song, so let's pray and ask God's blessing on the rest of it. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for allowing us to be your children, Lord. Thank you so much for that grace uh, that you've shed in our lives so abundantly, God. Thank you for the just the, the blessings that you shower out. Uh, your word tells us that you load us daily with benefits, God. And you're just so good to us, God. And we praise you for that, and we thank you for that. Lord, we uh, ask now that you'd take this offering and, and just bless it. Lord, use it.
to further your kingdom, Lord. You've allowed us to um, reach people and, and support missions. And, um, Lord, just worship you. Have a, have a church here, Lord, uh, through the, the offerings and the giving. And, Lord, we, we want to do more. And so I pray that you would just bless uh, each person as they give, Lord. Uh, we ask that your hand would be on the rest of this service, the music, the message. And we'll be sure to praise you for all that you do. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Zach, amen. So uh, I want you guys to just stay in your seats if you don't mind. And if you know these songs, you can sing along with us. If not, I just encourage you to listen to them and I just worship the Lord there in your heart. So. He was pierced for our transgression. Crushed for our sins, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our sins, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds by his wounds we are here we are healed by your sacrifice in the life that you gave we are healed transgressions and crushed for our sins the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds by his wounds we are
that taught my heart to feel embrace my fears relieved and how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are Praise God. Praise 
Take a minute and pray, if that's all right with you guys. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather here this evening, God. God, I pray that you would close the doors, that you would seal the building against the outside, God. That in this room, that the influences of the world couldn't reach us. That for just these few moments, we could let go of what's out there focus on you. Bless our fellowship and bless our worship, God.
God is like a fire defending me faithfully. Well, praise the Lord tonight. We are uh, we have a, a blessing. Um, I'm not preaching, and so I want to do this real quick. Um, the missionary letter tonight is from uh, John and Sue Henry. I just want to read you a little bit of what God's been doing. Uh, they said they want to thank all the churches for uh, keeping them in prayer, and uh, in the ministry there in, in Taiwan, uh, Thailand, this is where, where they minister, and also by way of radio into Laos. Uh, but he says, uh, Ruth led a 64-year-old homeless man to Jesus at her open-air clothing shop in downtown on the 20th. And afterwards, Sue, which is John's wife, uh, and her gave him a coat and a blanket. Uh, Pastor Oe reports that uh, they're, they're running about 20 in service. And Pastor uh, Sock uh, reports that his attendance is about 18. Uh, again, this is uh, church plants there in Thailand uh, from this ministry that we support. Um, they had a New Year's Fellowship meeting uh, representing four churches. There were 38 members present, and um, God is just doing some amazing things. Uh, he asked some prayer for some things. Uh, one is uh, the wedding of Pastor Sock and uh, his fiance on February 1st, 2014. And the reason why is um, there's going to be a master of ceremonies. There's also going to be someone who is actually performing the ceremony. And then... Uh, Brother Henry is going to be preaching a message at the wedding as well. And uh, he said that they take every opportunity to preach uh, the gospel to the lost because at this wedding, there's going to be about 150 people there, of which at least half they know will be lost. And most there will never have heard a clear presentation of the gospel. So uh, he's asked us to pray uh, that God will prepare the hearts of those that are there to receive Jesus as their Savior. And uh, again, God's doing some amazing things around the world. Uh, your support, your prayer support, your financial support for our missionaries is vital for uh, the, the, the Lord to continue to work around the world. So I just want to encourage you to do that. Last thing is, um, does anybody have a, a short word, just a short word, to share something real quick, how God has answered. I'm going to steal it. I, I'm going I'm to do a testimony of God answered prayer. And afterwards, if you have one too, you can do that. But we've been praying for a, a young lady uh, to, to get saved for uh, months, and she's been coming to church, and uh, she's, she said that she knows she needs to get saved, and uh, she just never would come forward, never would, would surrender her life. We just continue faithfully praying. Several, several people, ladies and men alike, have been praying for this, uh, this young lady, and this past Sunday, she came forward and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So that's a big praise of the Lord, answered prayer. Amen. <laughs> And then just real shortly, I won't steal this one, unless somebody didn't have it, but just a, a short, quick testimony, like a 20 seconds, 30 seconds of shining the light uh, this way. God giving you opportunity for you to shine the light of Jesus Christ to someone. Yes, sir, Brother Christian.
Amen. Praise God. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Funerals are a little easier because it's not one-on-one talking to a family member. <laughs> you just preach it and tell them like it is. No. Um, you guys, welcome Brother JT. Brother JT, come on now. Oh, there it is. There it is. I just got a cramp right here just from turning and holding that position. Okay. I'm in a serious cramp. Well, um, it is amazing that we sang multiple songs about grace tonight. I'll tell you guys real quick. I already had my sermon picked out. Allison already knows the title. It was Missio Dei, the mission of God. Mission of God in Latin is Missio Dei. And I had... I had my outline, I had my scripture, but it just wasn't coming together. The whole sermon was not coming together. And I was like, I was going to talk about um, God's covenant with Abraham and the fulfillment of that. And today with the church, with Jesus Christ and uh, the, the fulfillment of the seed of Abraham and go over to Galatians 3. And I was pumped. I was like, man, this is going to be exciting. But I sat down and I just could not get it to come together. And tonight... I'll be preaching on grace. And uh, it's just amazing how the Lord works. Kind of confirmation, Brother Turner gets up here and starts singing. (laughs) It's amazing how the Lord works. So um, before I get into the sermon, I got got something to read here. And it is on airplane mode, so we shouldn't have any any noises. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, some of you are probably very familiar with him. He was a Lutheran pastor. Uh, and theologian, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. It's a famous, famous book. But he was a pastor during Nazi Germany, and he stayed in Nazi Germany to preach Christ crucified, to continue to preach the gospel while the, uh, while the Nazis were reigning there. And eventually they did capture him in April 1943. And then April 1945, he was hung in a Nazi concentration camp for faithfully preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what I want to share tonight is he, he's coined, he had coined the phrase cheap grace. And here's his quote. It says, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. Living and incarnate. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And tonight's sermon is going to be on cheap grace, the cheapening of God's grace. Um, It's amazing. You know, I look back on my own salvation experience, December 2nd, 2007. Uh, I thought I was saved when I was seven years old. And, you know, I, I may have been, but I didn't truly experience and taste the grace of God until December 2nd, 2007. Brother Turner. Uh, knows that day very clearly. He remembers. He remembers just wrapping my arms around him and crying. Brother Gary Dillon remembers too. I run up to him and I grab him. I'm all messed up. So, uh, but either way, I knew it was God's grace working in my life at that moment. You know, I got saved. I knew it was by grace through faith in Jesus Christ I was saved. But what I didn't know was that, you know, when I started going to work and people start saying, man, did you join a cult? I'm like, no, man, I'm saved. What I didn't know was that something was actively going on, that the grace of God was actively working out in my life. It talks about uh, the song that Zach sang, talking about God being our defense, God being our healer. Well, we don't deserve to be defended by God. We don't deserve the healing of God. We don't deserve these things. So grace is actively working out in our lives. And all too often, I believe that we, we miss this fact as we'll get, we'll see here in just a little bit, and we cheapen God's grace is what it really is, okay? So before we read the scripture, let's pray, and then we'll get into God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening, for this opportunity. 
Lord, thank you for the time of worship that we've already had. Lord, just singing about your grace, thinking about your beauty, Lord. Thinking about those things that you've done were so undeserving. Each one of us, Lord, have gone astray. And Lord, yet you redeemed, you saw fit to send your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to shed his precious blood. Lord, and then to become victorious in his resurrection. And then to impart to us the ministry of reconciliation that we can take that treasure of the gospel to a lost and dying world and share it with them, Lord. It's beyond me, but it shows your grace. Lord, I thank you, and I pray that you'd be with us tonight. Lord, I pray that I would decrease, that you might increase, that the Holy Spirit would fall on this place, God, and that our hearts would be moved to follow after you, Lord, to seek your face daily and diligently and fervently, Lord, and that each one of us would be conformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, drawing closer to him on a daily basis. We just love you and praise you in Jesus' heavenly name, I pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> Titus 2, 11 through 15, if you want to uh, flip over there. Starting out here, uh, I will give you some historical background here in just a second, but it says, in starting in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We all know Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. Teaching us. So, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, comma, not period, comma, teaching us. It's the grace of God teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God our, and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So a quick little background here with the, uh, uh, the context of the scripture here. Paul had left, if you're in my, my Titus class, by the way, you're going to hear it again, I'm sorry. But Paul had left Titus in Crete. He went on to Nicopolis. Well, uh, the Cretans were a vile people, okay? They were a violent people. They were a people that were gluttonous. They were drunkards. And Paul actually even quotes in Titus 1.12, one of their own prophets. His, his name is Epimenides. And Epimenides had said um, that, well, that they, were a, they had slow bellies and that they were, well, let's flip over there and read it. He quotes him here. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts with slow bellies. Okay, and then Paul says in verse 13, this witness is true. So this man, one of their own, talks about how vile they are. Even other historians like Livy and Polybius and Strabo, all these men, uh, ancient historians, all these men write about the wickedness of the Cretans, okay? So Paul has commanded Titus, and I'll probably say Timothy a whole bunch tonight, okay? Just go with it. I'm talking about Titus. Paul has commanded Titus to stay in Crete and to, and to ordain elders, to suppress the false teachings, but also to set in order these things, right? The, the things of the faith, essentially. So he's telling him, set these things in order, ordain elders, and suppress the false teachers. It's a huge task because of the wickedness of the Cretans, all right? So with that being said, let's go on to the, the first portion of chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 10. So we, so we can see what it is that Titus tells him to preach to these wicked people. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. Okay, I talked about them being drunkards, gluttonous, violent, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers and not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say, to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own master 
and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And then go back to verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So it's important to know the context of the scripture here in, in Titus so that we understand well, why, is he, why is he saying these specific things. Now we know that this has application for us today. But it, once again, it, it identifies what he's saying. Be sober, be grave, be temperate, because these, pe these people are vile. So with that, with that being said, he tells us that the grace of God has appeared, training us to renounce ungodliness. So with this in mind, we must identify that God's grace was poured out in salvation. We know that. God's grace was poured out in salvation and, the forgiveness of, and in the forgiveness of our sins. But we must recognize it is also an agent for change in our lives. It's an agent for change in our lives. It's not just a one time, well, praise the Lord, I'm forgiven, right? And now I get to do whatever I want. It's an agent for change. True faith brings about this change. Remember, Paul also states in Galatians 2, 20, uh, chapter 2, verses 20 through 21, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So this clearly points to a product of change in an individual's life by grace through faith. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, right? However, this does not teach. I, I, wanna, I wanna make this very clear tonight. My message is not a works-based salvation message. Uh, I'll make that real clear here in just a little bit, but I just wanna stress that because it might sound like I'm up here saying, well, maybe it sounds like he's saying to us that we got to have good works. That's not what I'm saying. So uh, it says we're not frustrating the grace of God by saying we achieve anything through our own change and works. In fact, all that is good in us or, or anything that is even a reflection of Christ to the world is because of his grace, period. So grace brings about a natural establishing or upholding of the law. Romans 3.31 says, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. So we're establishing the law through our faith. However, not to perfection while in these present bodies. Also, we have to remember that. We're not going to be perfect while we're here in these present bodies. So I'm not saying that we're conformed into the image of Christ and we will reach perfection while we're here on this, this earth. That's not going to happen. But what I am saying is that this active agent of grace will draw us closer, will, wanna, will make us want to be more like him. So, because of the faith placed in Jesus Christ, saved by grace through faith. Therefore, it is the grace that has been revealed that enables the change in the lives of these Christians. Now, with all this being said, it's important for us to understand what grace is. I, I'm not going to preach a whole message and then say, well, I hope everyone knew what grace was. So, looking at, and I know, we, we all have a, we have a, a definition that, you know, that we normally hear in church, but I think there's so much more, and that's what we're going to expound, expound upon tonight. So here's what grace is. Free and unmerited favor of God. We hear it all the time. It's the free and unmerited favor of God. It's getting what I don't deserve. Praise the Lord. And that is true. That's exactly what it is. But there's so much to that. So here's an acronym that defines, uh, defines it in a way that helps us understand it. G, God's R, riches, A, at, C, Christ, E, expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. All right? That's what it is. God's riches in our lives at Christ's expense. But I believe that A.W. Tozer gives us a better theological definition. He says, grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits on the undeserving. I'll read that again. Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits benefits, these benefits on the undeserving. It is something we are to grow in. 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So it's something that we're growing in. I said it's an active agent. It is something we are to stand in. Romans 5.12, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It is something we are to be strengthened by. Hebrews 13, 9 says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So, 
Grace is something that is actively working in the true believer's life, bringing about a change and conforming the believer into the image of Christ, okay? we got to remember that. That's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer was talking about, he had, he had talked about an age would come if people, if Christians believe that grace was just this one-time thing and it was a, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but a get-out-of-jail-free card, well, I'm saved. I can live however I want now. He said if it turned into that, then we were going to see the fall of Christianity. And obviously, he's not talking, we know that that's not going to happen in the, fact, in the concept of, uh, you know, God's kingdom being established here. I, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the apostasy. The apostasy coming and taking over the true church, as we'll see here in just a little bit. So, grace is something that act, is actively working on the true believer's life, bringing about change and conforming the believer into the image of Christ. What grace is not, it is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It is not a person saying, well, I sinned again. I sinned again, but God's grace has got me covered. Yeah, I know I did it again, but praise, praise God for his grace. It is not one person saying, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, and since I'm forgiven my sins, I can live however I want. And when times get bad, Jesus is going to bail me out. He's got me. That's someone that has perverted and misunderstood and cheapened what grace is. Listen, if, if you're in here today, and I'm not accusing anyone, okay, but if you are in here today and that's your attitude towards grace, then I would say you may not have truly tasted of the grace of God. That's why I was talking about my testimony at the very beginning because I experienced, I tasted of the grace of God the day, December 2nd, 2007, when I gave my life to Christ and something radically changed and I, I want to pursue God. Yeah, I mess up. Yeah, I stumble. You know, but man, when I get back to my feet, I just, I, there's something in me. I just want to be more like him. I just want to live for him. That doesn't mean that I'm perfect. And yeah, I make a lot of mistakes. A lot of you in here know me, okay? But man, I love Jesus. I love him. And it's because of his grace. It's because of that active agent working in me. So those that have this mentality, it's an abuse and a perversion of what God's grace truly is. Paul's very clear about this in Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We all know it. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? God's grace has enabled us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and to, to abstain from that sinful life. Once again, we will not reach perfection while in these present bodies. But man, we have the power of God through his grace to become more like his son daily if we strive after him. Sadly, this Pauline theology here, that, that's what we're talking about is the Pauline theology of grace, of justification by faith. It was revitalized by Martin Luther. It, it didn't go away, but it was revitalized by Martin Luther in the 1500s during the Reformation. Uh, he, write, he revitalized this justification by faith in the face of, he was facing Catholicism. They were, they were teaching that you could receive grace through the take, uh, partaking of the sacraments, okay? So Martin Luther stands up and said, we're justified by faith. Well, 500 years later, what's happened with this justification by faith? And we are justified by faith, okay? By grace through faith, we are saved. But what's happened is the cheapening of that, just as Dietrich Bonhoeffer had said would happen. So um, when Martin Luther made made this statement. He was doing it in the face of, uh, of papal indulgences. He was doing it in the face of people working for their salvation. And he's saying, no, no, we're saved by grace through faith alone. And he never, I'm sure, he never thought that we would take that as a, a ticket to live however we wanted to live. Okay, because people during the Reformation were dying dying for this faith. So, like I said, many fall back on the, I'm saved by grace alone. And they, use, they even use the example. We'll see them uh, using the example in Romans 4. And I'm sure witnessing to people or even maybe trying to correct a brother and sister in Christ, you've seen them turn back to different scriptures. Well, I'm covered by grace. Or we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace, okay? We're going to get into, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the law and grace, okay? 
And we'll talk about which one carries a heavier responsibility. Grace carries a heavier responsibility. So, um, like I said, they'll turn to the scriptures and they've, they've perverted this grace, this understanding. So, I'm challenging everyone in the room with this. God's working grace in your life brings change, period. God's working grace in your life brings change. If you have this mentality, man, I just, I'm, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I do because God's got me. And there's not something in you that is totally convicted by that. Man, get down on your knees and turn to the Lord and ask him to forgive you, okay? Because you need to. And he has, he has a plan. It brings about a newness of life, a new creation. So I believe a good way to really identify what I'm trying to express is by watching God's grace work in the Old Testament, then compare it to the New Testament. And we'll see the same theme. This grace through faith brought about a desire to love and live for God Almighty. I have till nine, right? All right. <laughs> okay. I think that was a no. <laughs> All right. So let's look at Abraham in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll go to Genesis 12, 1 through 5. Everyone's very familiar with this. This is the covenant that's established, a uh, portion of the covenant. And we know according to Romans 4 that Abraham was counted righteous because of his faithfulness, not because of his works. Okay? However, when we study the life of Abraham, we see him leave Ur and go into the land of Canaan. He does it out of obedience that was brought about by a change in his heart. The grace of God, this active agent enabling him to change. Genesis 12, 1 through 5 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed. God told him to do it and he did it. Abraham departed as, as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. If you're in my Sunday school class, when we were going through Stephen's sermon um, in Acts chapter 7, we talked about the track that Abraham and his family would have made from Ur to the land of the Canaanites. We talked about that, and it was not an easy journey. Okay, And it says here that he was 75 years old. He was changed. He was changed to follow in radical obedience God's command to get up and leave because of a promise. We have a promise. We have a, an eternal hope through Jesus Christ. If, if Abraham was willing to respond in radical obedience because of a promise from God, a covenant with God, and we're partakers of the same covenant, we need to respond in radical obedience. And we have the grace of God enabling us to do so. So, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they come. I jumped ahead there. So, this was not because of an obedience to the law. There was no Mosaic law at this point, okay? It was faith that drove Abraham, and his obedience brought about by the work of God's grace in Abraham. We also see him take his son Isaac up the mountain as a sacrifice to God. We're not going to read the scriptures, but we're all familiar with the story. Takes Isaac up there. Father, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? God will provide. God will provide. Okay? Faithfulness. He was faithful. We also see Abraham stumble as he lies about Sarah. I was talking about me. You know, I've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. Abraham, a man that was following radical obedience, he made mistakes. He lied about Sarah. He takes Hagar and gets her pregnant. But here's the thing, we see a faithful obedience till the end because of his faith and God's grace working in this man's life. God's grace was extended to Paul as we see this wretched sinner. Here's our New Testament example. And uh, this wretched sinner and persecutor of the church and of Christ saved by the grace of God on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, 1 through 8. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of his way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Oh, the grace of God was poured out on this man this day. The grace of God. And he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? I was going to persecute your church. 
I was going to persecute the believers. I was going to persecute your name. God, what do you want me to do? And he tells him, arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they laid him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He followed in obedience. Grace was actively working in his life from that point forward. So here's what we see by the working of God's grace in Paul's life. We see that we see man that proclaims himself to be a bondservant and prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul calls himself that in Ephesians 3.1. In Titus, when he talks about himself being a servant, a prisoner for Jesus Christ. We see a man who, for the sake of faith, keeps from doing things and teaches us to keep from doing things that would offend those weaker in the faith. A man, this is a man covered by grace. A man covered by grace. And he says, no, 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 don't do those things if it's going to offend someone weaker in the faith. Don't do those things if it's going to keep someone from coming to Christ. But I'm covered in grace. I, I, can, I can do anything, right? I can live how I want to live. No, I was talking about the weight, the responsibility of the law in comparison to grace. Grace is so much heavier because we now have the responsibility of being the lights in the darkness. We have the responsibilities of being bearers of his image to people that have no hope. The responsibility of grace is heavy. But once again, this agent of change, God's grace working in our lives, as Paul tells Titus, to preach and to teach to these Christians because God's grace will change them from these drunkards, from these, these gluttonous, violent people. God's grace will change them. Preach it to them. Correct their actions. And they'll change so, here's what we don't see in either of these men, or in the instruction given to Titus. A self-serving lifestyle full of personal sinful indulgences and a neglect of living is a reflection of Christ. This misconception of grace is becoming more and more prevalent amongst Christians today in this world where the church is conforming more to this world and looking less like Christ. This is what I was talking about early at the begin earlier at the beginning of the, the sermon. In a world where we are seeing more and more apostates rise up out of the true church, these wolves coming up out of the true church, leading many away from the faith, they've perverted God's grace. And this is the lie, that grace is only about our undeserved forgiveness that allows us to continue to live in sin. That is not the case. God's grace allows us to become more like him. So the truth is that grace is not just about our undeserved, undeserved forgiveness. It is about our enablement to serve to grow and to be molded into the image of Christ as we see Paul teach. I mean, these are men who we see faithfully following after God and keeping the faith until the end. I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Because the working of God's grace in their life, this active agent of grace. And this is challenging because what about those who claim to be Christians and claim to be forgiven of their sin and yet live with complete disregard to the commands of Christ? You may say again, we're no longer under law. And you are correct. We're under grace through faith in Christ. Who says, though, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, who says, those who, keep, who, those who love me keep my commands. The same Christ that says the two greatest commands of these, to love the Lord thy God, to love thy neighbor. <clears throat> then under grace, as I said, lays a, the heavier responsibility. Keep his commands, love the Lord thy God, and love your neighbor, because people are dying and going to hell, and I've sent you to be the ones that are the light and the darkness. Grace is a serious thing. It's not something that we can take lightly and use as this get out of jail free card. It's something we have to look at as empowerment to serve him. So, like I said, here's the truth. It, true faith brings about a change of heart, a change of character, a change of desire, and a change of focus because we're enabled by that grace through our faith to change. And with true faith comes a new position towards Jesus Christ. And Paul in his instruction to Titus is saying that the grace of God teaches us to renounce ungodliness and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. This was the instruction Titus was to give to the Cretans. And this is the instruction for us today. We cannot be deceived in thinking that just because we or others have professed to believe in Christ means that salvation is present. 
Okay? We know in James 2, the demons believe and they tremble. They know he's real too. All right? But that's not receiving grace. James makes it very clear that a faith without works is dead. And this understanding of grace that I've talked about tonight is something that can help us bring to light how Romans 4, uh, Abraham being justified by his faith, and James 2, a work or a faith without works is dead. This reconciles the two. There is no contradiction in the scripture there, okay? Nope. What he's saying in James 2 is, guess what? That grace that you received through faith, that salvation that you received, it's going to bring about works. True faith brings about works, period. It brings about a sincere change in your life. And in Romans 4, with Abraham's justification through faith, I'm not going to read all the scriptures. Uh, we're running out of time, but... Abraham's justification through his faith it was accounted to him to, as righteousness, his obedience. You know what? We still saw him get up and leave because he'd been changed. So these passages of scripture, there's a reconciliation there. And, and here's, this is going to be closing. Uh, Zach, I'm really weird about the whole closing thing. Do you want to come up here and, and get ready? Yeah, I still haven't got that closing thing down. One of these days I will. So here it is. Both of these men, James and Paul, knew and understood that the byproduct of true faith is the working of, the working of grace in the believer's life, which conforms them more and more into the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So Paul instructs Titus to instruct these, these Christians because the grace of God has enabled them to change from the culture and the worldliness they are surrounded by. And it has enabled them to abstain from being conformed to this world and allows them to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. Listen, there's a lesson in this for us. There's a lesson. If he's instructing Titus, teach them these things because they'll change. We can look at it and say, man, the grace of God has enabled me to abstain from conforming to the worldliness and ungodliness that's out there and to becoming more Christ-like? God has enabled me with that? That's a powerful thing. And in closing, we all at one point were like these Christians. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, then you're still guilty before God for your sin, just as the vile Christians were. And there is a payment for that sin and is an eternity in a place called the lake of fire where the wrath of God will be poured out on those who reject God's gift of his risen son eternally. But by God's grace, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to shed his blood as the payment for our sins. And three days later, he rose from the grave and has gone to prepare a place in his father's house for all who believe. Those that do not receive Jesus Christ, if you're here and you have not tasted of the grace that I've talked about tonight, have to call on the name of Jesus Christ. All those that believe that receive Jesus are delivered from the wrath and promised eternal life with God and all, all this is possible because of his amazing grace, you know, amazing grace. I encourage you tonight, if you're sitting here, we're going to have invitation here in just a second. I'm going to pray. We'll have invitation. But if you're sitting here and you say, man, I do not know if I'm saved. Grab me. Grab me. Don't leave this place with uncertainty. Okay, grab one of the elders. Grab Brother Kyle. Grab a friend. And if you're sitting here tonight and you say, man, I know I'm saved, but I am not. I am not allowing grace to enable me and empower me to change and be conformed into the image of Christ. Come down here and cry out and ask God to help you and to forgive you because he has a plan. He has a plan. And he wants us to be a part of it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for your word and I thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, you're so sweet. You are so sweet and we are so undeserving. Lord, I love you. I pray that tonight you would be glorified. Lord, that people's lives, if, if there are some in here, that God, maybe, maybe there is something in their life that just... It's holding them back. I pray that they'd come forward tonight and they would bring it to you. That they would lay it down before you, Lord. 
and that they would begin to walk after you and allow your grace to enable them and empower them to change. I pray that if there's any right now, Lord, in this building that have never truly tasted of your grace, if they've been confused by the perversion and the cheapening of grace that's been made prevalent through the false teachings, Lord, if they have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that tonight would be the night of salvation for them. God, thank you for your amazing grace. In Jesus' heavenly name I pray, amen. Praise the Lord tonight. Thank you so much, Brother JT, for that message. God's grace is not a cheap grace, and I uh, thank the Lord for uh, just a constant reminder in our lives. It's a, it's a good, good thing to uh, remember that God's grace is supposed to be that enabling uh, to live for Him, not to live for the flesh. And uh, and so again, I thank you for that, Brother JT, and. Uh, I want to just say a couple things real quick before we dismiss. The first thing is we do have outreach tomorrow night. 
and uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, express that experiencing of God's grace and uh, serving him and so we do that at six there's a meal and child care and so uh, I would invite you out if you don't come already uh, to come and help us shine that light in this area uh, also um, brother Ryan Jones asked me if you have signed up and you're planning on going on our Guatemala uh, mission trip then your deposits uh, need to be due no later than Sunday so that's a hundred and ten dollar deposit and a hundred and fifty dollar uh, plane deposit so a total of 260 for Guatemala mission trip last thing as iron sharpening iron next Tuesday all you guys want to make sure that you come out it's gonna be a good time of fellowship good time of uh, food and a, and a little devotion there and you don't want to miss that Anybody else have anything this evening? Prayer requests we need to... Yes, ma'am. Their family. Okay. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's what's that? That's tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay. If you're turning 64, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. See you. There you go. Bike ride Saturday. See Brother Nosh, Brother Robert. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes? Yes, ma'am. He fell? Oh, okay. Will do. Amen. Let's pray. And Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for this uh, evening again. Lord, we do thank you so much for your grace. Uh, uh, the the words we use really can't describe that, even words like amazing and uh, marvelous. Uh, God, that's the best the way we can really express that uh, in our limited understanding of your grace. And uh, God, I just ask that you would help every single one of us uh, walk away tonight uh, with a greater appreciation of your grace. Lord, to live our lives uh, in, in your grace, uh, to serve you, uh, to be those witnesses you've called us to be. Uh, Lord, not to indulge ourselves in our, in, in, in our flesh, uh, but God, again, serve you. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for the message again. Thank you for the opportunity to meet. We lift up, uh, Lord, those prayer requests, the family that's having um, the funeral service this Saturday. Uh, I pray that you just minister to them and give them the comfort they need. Uh, Lord, the family members that have lost uh, their loved one. Lord, I lift up Miss Kathy's brother. Uh, we don't know what's going on with him other than he's fallen and I, I just pray that you would uh, help him and, and uh, we pray that there's no broken bones and uh, that he completely recovers from uh, whatever injuries he may have sustained and uh, Lord we again just thank you for this opportunity and we ask you to take us home safely in Jesus name amen children drawing them